Ben and Matthew are going to be discussing why poor productivity doesn't come from lazy teams and how other organisations are becoming more productive through the application of the approaches defined in team topologies. I know it's going to be a great session, so I'm going to hand over to Matthew and Bendit to get us started. Thank you, Rekha. Thanks, Rekha. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Dodd. I'm a co-founder at Arma Cooney. Um, I'm a consulting CTO working with startups, scale-ups and global organisations often in regulated environments, such as healthcare, energy, or financial services. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Skelton. I'm a founder of Conflux. I'm the co-author of the book Team Topologies. So today we're looking at how organizations are meeting the productivity challenge by applying Team Topologies. The takeaway points are these. We need to stop obsessing over individual productivity and start thinking in terms of multi-team flow. There's a mindset switch needed from managing lots of dependencies to kind of unblocking flow and finding boundaries. And organizations are increasingly turning to partners like Armacuni and Complex to help accelerate the effective adoption of these kind of fast flow and team topologies principles. So our talk uh, today has four main sections. Let's start by looking at the actual productivity challenges that we're seeing in the industry at the moment. We'll follow that by looking at one of the ways in which we can improve productivity by using what we call in Team Topology as a platform, and specifically the way in which we use a platform for non-blocking flow. Then we'll look at a little bit around the role of managers that we mentioned before, switching from kind of coordinating dependencies into finding flow and unblocking flow. And finally, we'll look at a few success patterns with Team Topologies. This is the book I mentioned before, Team Topologies. It was published by IT Revolution Press in September 2019. It's co-authored by me, Matthew Skelton, and my co-author, Manuel Paige. And I think it's fair to say that this book has um, been uh, extremely helpful for many organizations around the world. Um, we've sold now over 100,000 copies, I believe, at this point, which makes it um, which makes it a very give it a very wide reach. We've got translations in Korean, Japanese, Chinese, and I think uh, Portuguese is coming soon. Um, um, and for many, many organizations, many organizations, it provides a kind of language and set of templates and principles for thinking about um, organizing for fast flow. And specifically in that context, if you're going very slowly and you only make changes once every year or once every three years, then other rules apply. But in the context where we're making changes multiple times a day and we need to make sure that those are safe and effective and in the hands of our customers as quickly as possible, these patterns and principles seem to uh, be very helpful. Great. Thank you, Matthew. So what is the actual productivity challenge that we're facing? Um, productivity means um, a lot of things to a lot of people. So we're going to quickly cover some broader themes and then really focus on the specifics of what team topologies means for productivity. Um, there, so at a macro level, there is a productivity challenge. There is a productivity index, and this is tracked by the ONS here in the UK. And the UK, as an example, has been flatlining in terms of productivity um, since the global crisis in 2008. So as an example, Germany is 28% more productive than the UK and the US, um, and the US is 31% more productive. So why does this matter? Why does this matter for us all is that there is a greater sense of social prosperity that can come as a nation if we are more productive. And also that's a, it also presents an opportunity to improve our overall living standard. So it's an area of um, concern and interest for all of us. There is also a mild recession affecting many regions of the world. Organizations are being asked to do more with what they've currently got and the growth in output that they're also expected um, to create isn't gonna come from a greater cost or a greater number of people. So increasingly people are looking for new ways um, to deliver more with what they've already got. And also thinking across the sort of macro into the micro, um, one client that I work with, Res, are a, a, the largest independent renewables um, company. And they have obviously got a challenge, which is they need to 10x the amount of renewable assets that they can manage so that they can meet this global challenge. Um, and that means a new way of working, the current way that they had, they were producing great software, but this 10xing of um, the ask upon them means they've got to think of a new way of achieving that. Um, and also productivity, certainly in my experience, is linked to joy. Blocking flow disrupts our ability to meet the challenges of our customers, to get exciting new things into their hands. 
And it also means that if we can't meet those challenges, we don't get that sweet dopamine hit of actually shipping value and having a positive impact on people's lives. However, so those broader themes aside, the main assertion of this session is that many, if not most organizations still have this pre-digital operating model. Organizations, organizations are trying to put their foot to the floor at the moment and really very little is happening. And because at their core, many still have synchronization as their primary concern. Um, we can see this in how organizations are organized, but then also how those the people within those organizations actually um, interact. And this is not something we see in nature. We don't see synchronization as the core way that um, things take place. Uh, and this is really a Taylorist view that has persisted from the 1930s. So to summarize this section, we've got this call to action on the macro level and also the micro level uh, to increase productivity. Um, and with many organizations not designed for fast flow, so I hear you see so you say, what are the options that we have to boost organizational productivity? Thanks, Ben. So the first thing I'd like to share with you is uh, the idea from Team Topologies of a platform for non-blocking flow. Team Topologies provides many things, including language for dealing with flow, uh, boundaries, architecture, and organizational dynamics. It provides us some heuristics or clues for organizing teams and software. Because it turns out that the way in which teams are organized has a strong effect on the way in which our software is likely to be organized or, or, or the architecture that emerges. And crucially, it's got Team Topologies has a focus on fast flow as a key driver for lots of decisions. Just a quick recap. In Team Topologies, we talk about four different types of team. A streamlined team in yellow, that's end-to-end -end responsibility, long-term responsibility for one product or service, or perhaps a, a small number of smallish products and services. Uh, we can curate them, we can look after them, we build and run that, we don't hand over to another team. End-to-end -end uh, end -end responsibility for, the, for these, these things, these bits of software or these, these customer-facing services. And that's our starting point. And ideally, most, of, most teams in the organization would be arranged like that. So we're decomposing what we're offering to our customers into quite small services, bringing those together um, uh, at a larger level when, when needed. But at some point, these streamlined teams are going to exceed their cognitive load because they're taking on so much stuff to be in the, retain their independence that um, they can no longer focus on their core mission. And so we introduced three different types of team, enabling team, which is a team of experts that's shown in purple on the diagram, a team of experts who they don't build anything themselves. They help streamline teams to increase their autonomy, capability, awareness. They also detect gaps in capabilities and can use that to inform decisions in other parts of the organization. Then we've got a complicated subsystem team in, in red or orange in the middle of the diagram. And that's for the situations where there's a part of the system which needs highly specialized awareness to be able to produce it effectively. It could be something around video processing. It could be something around um, uh, some aspect of law or legal approval or something like that, or perhaps it's around the financial regulation, something like that, where it's, it needs a high degree of awareness and knowledge and maybe algorithms and that kind of thing. And it would be too awkward to have to expect a stream aligned team to own that kind of awareness because it's too specialized. And finally, we've got a platform team at the bottom uh, shown in blue. Actually, what we realize now since the book was published is that it's not really a team, it's more of a grouping, more of a platform grouping. It's like a container for other types of team, because inside that platform grouping, you will find stream aligned teams, enabling teams and complicated subsystem teams and other platform groupings. So see the see the platform team is more like a grouping. But the, the purpose of that platform group is to improve flow in streamlined teams by reducing cognitive load. That's the purpose in team topologies. That's the purpose of what we call a platform. Um, and it's an interesting perspective on, on uh, providing capabilities to other teams in the organization, other groups in the organization. Improve flow by reducing cognitive load. And taking that perspective seems to be massively helpful for lots of organizations. It gets away from previous incarnations of kind of platforms and infrastructure where it's focused on cost reduction and sharing licenses and blah, blah, blah. Some of that stuff is needed at certain times. Um, there's other kind of platforms that are focused on kind of harvesting uh, existing um, uh, services and, and capabilities and sharing them out. That's also useful, but the team topologies lens is very much about improving flow by reducing cognitive load. So that's the lens we're using today to look at these things. 
Now, in addition to four uh, different team types, we've got three different team interaction modes, because of course, in a complex adaptive system, like in a large organization, the behavior that emerges is not dependent on the individual parts. It depends on the interactions between these parts. So we've got these three team interaction modes defined. Collaboration, two teams working together to achieve a specific thing over a short period of time. X as a service, one team providing, one team consuming something at a nice service boundary and facilitating one team helping another team to detect and improve its capabilities. Collaboration and facilitating are uh, temporary interaction modes. They might last days or weeks, but not longer than that. X as a service could in theory last many years if we found a good boundary. And there's a bit of a dynamic here between these three different modes. We need to work out which is the right mode to use at, at this point in time. Set expectations between different teams to help us detect if there's a misalignment between what we're expecting and what's actually happening and so on. It provides a very powerful language for, for simple but powerful language for for a uh, much more effective dialogue between different teams and groups inside the organization. And then we can start to look at a, 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 a tiny segment of the organization in a, in a particular snapshot in time. So this week, part of the organization looks like this. We might have an enabling team helping a streamline team at the top. That same streamline team is also collaborating with a complicated subsystem team. Perhaps they're working on a new interface or a new API or some new way of instantiating that library or something like this. That same complicated subsystem team, though, is providing a service to a streamlined team. So there's no there's no detailed collaboration happening between um, the second streamlined team in the middle and that complicated subsystem team. It's just it feels much more straightforward that kind of interaction. And finally, the platform group is providing a service to that streamlined team in in the middle of the diagram. But this is just a snapshot. In two weeks' time, the interactions will change because the purpose or the focus of the activity inside these teams will have changed by that point. And that's an important aspect of team support. It's an adaptive model. It's, we're not looking for a single static team, a set of team relationships. So here's a takeaway point here. There's a lot more detail in the Team Topologies book. Obviously, there's a lot more detail in the, in the online training courses that we have on the Team Topologies Academy. But use this idea of a platform to really help to uh, think about productivity and particularly to improve flow. Think about the purpose of a platform being to improve flow and reduce team cognitive load for teams using the platform. And taking that approach seems to really help with conversations about productivity, conversations about uh, focusing on work that's much more effective for the organization. There's a need to think about uh, dependencies inside in in across the organization particularly dependencies between teams there's really va there's real value in in tracking these and separating them into blocking in versus non-blocking let me explain what i mean by that um if we've got a team at the top of this diagram here we've got a series of yellow arrows going from left to right and if we've if we're in a situation where we've got blocking flow then a team might be doing some work and then they get to a point where they need to wait for another team to make a decision before they can continue. And this might be about compliance. It might be around um, data integrity or who knows what, something like this. So they wait on that other team and the other team finally comes back and says, yep, yeah, okay, that's fine. You can move on. And they might hit another kind of compliance block before they can move on. So that's kind of blocking flow or blocking compliance checks. And what we need to do is move towards a situation where we've got non-blocking checks. How do we achieve that? Well, what we do is we take all of the awareness and value that exists in that blocking compliance check and instead move it into a team to bodies platform that we can consume as a service. We can consume all of those checks as a service or the vast majority of those checks. So at the bottom of the diagram, we've got a non-blocking flow where we've got, we've got the same kind of activities happening. But then at the point where we need to check the data for its integrity or check for some sort of compliance, we can just call into the platform and do that as a service. So the platform is helping to provide better flow. We can also use the four key metrics from the Accelerate book and uh, add what we call waiting time, wait time. Uh, so here's the book Accelerate. It was published by the same uh, publishers as Team Topologies, so that's IT Revolution Press, and Accelerate was published in 2018. And the, the four key metrics that they found in the book, which predict high organizational performance, um, 
Now these lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore and change fail percentage. Now, these are all really useful, but relatively low level metrics, particularly focused on, on software delivery. They, they can be applied to other kind of uh, knowledge work situations too, but they're, they're, very, um, they're, they're very much applied to, to software delivery. We can actually add an additional one as well. We can look at wait time. So the wait time is the time that the total time we're waiting between useful activities. And this comes from value stream mapping and, 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 um, and, and related concepts. Um, so look at how long we're actually waiting between periods of useful activity. And really think about it, think about it like this modern platform should be obsessed by flow and wait times in the teams that consume the platform. So the platform itself should care how long these streamlined teams are waiting to be able to do useful things. And if these teams are waiting a long time between useful activities, what can the platform do to, to reduce that wait time? How, what can we build in the platform that helps to reduce that waiting time for these teams that use it and therefore improve flow? And that should be almost on, on obsession, an obsession by kind of product managers and people in this platform grouping to help improve flow. So let's have a little look at the role of managers within team topologies, within the team topologies context. And really that is the role of a manager in this world is about finding flow. The first thing that managers can help to do is to continuously untangle business concepts. Because in many organizations, the, the business concepts are so kind of coupled together and tangled up, if you like, conceptually, that the software itself is not surprisingly tangled as well, because it's simply reflecting the concepts. And so by helping to untangle the, the, the business concepts at this kind of upstream level, at a conceptual level, it helps the software to remain decoupled and better aligned to flow as well. Managers can also help to find and adjust team and system boundaries for flow. So if one team currently is taking on too many things and is struggling a bit, bit and, and therefore not making as much progress as they should, can we change their responsibility boundaries so they can have a better focus and another team can take on more aspects or perhaps we just consume those aspects from outside. So we're all we're thinking about what does flow look like and how could we adjust these boundaries to improve flow. We're looking to minimize handoffs from one team to another. In fact, we're looking ideally with a streamlined team, we have no handoffs at all. And so if there are existing handoffs, managers can help to have discussions around what those handoffs look like with the aim of removing them. We've already talked about avoiding blocking dependencies as a key aspect, particularly when we're talking about consuming things from a platform. And some decision making needs to move to the teams. Teams need to be able to make a bunch of decisions by themselves about what they focus on and how they improve things and that kind of stuff. That helps to improve flow if we empower teams at a certain level to make decisions about the, how they do work and the work that they choose to do. Ultimately, there's a mindset shift. And here's the manager mindset shift that, that, that needs to take place in this kind of fast flow teams bodies context. Instead of trying to coordinate all these different activities that happen, instead focus on enabling flow or unblocking flow. Don't try to coordinate all the different pieces in this big complicated Rube Goldberg or Heath Robinson machine. Instead, focus on flow, focus on helping multiple different teams in the organization achieve fast flow in their in their in their domain context in, in their area of focus. Ultimately, managing for flow is kind of more effective and satisfying really than managing for deadlines and dates. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, so in the time that we've got left, we're hoping to end in six minutes or so. So there's lots of time for the questions that have come in, uh, which is really great. Um, so we're going to go through some of the patterns that we are seeing uh, people use as they're implementing team topologies to boost team topology, uh, to boost productivity. Um, so the flow of change and feedback is a, should be a key concern, but many organizations aren't on the same page about what is actually happening. Individuals in an organization all have their own perspective and their own experience about how value is delivered. 
Um, and conversations can go on at cross purposes for months and even years about how that actually works and how it could possibly change to remove the blockers that Matthew's already talked about. So quite often when I meet organizations, which I do relatively often, um, the sense of show me your map, show me how you see flow moving through your organization. And the answer is often, no, sorry, not today. We are going to do it soon. We don't have it yet. Um, or we don't know quite what you mean in doing so. Um, so one, so the, and that flow of value is often an elephant that you can't see all at once. Um, and there are lots of very powerful tools, domain-driven design, value stream mapping, Matthew's already mentioned, um, team topologies mapping using um, the shapes and interaction methods, uh, Wardley mapping, um, but starters for 10, value stream mapping is a really important tool. It allows you to focus at the customer at the very heart of it, it allows everyone to build a visual, but also a mental model about how flow actually happens. Um, it provides you data about where are the opportunities to change. Um, and it allows you to highlight where the, that current synchronization activity is blocking um, and how you could uh, move from that model into a new way of working as described by Matthew. Um, and it's also a great storytelling tool. It allows you to visualize the flow as it was, and as you make changes, how that is improving over time. Um, it's also very important to have this sense of shared terminology and an, articul an articulation of the concerns um, are often taken for granted. So it's, um, for example, I went, I've spent time in an organization where it literally took me one year to get everyone to align on what test-driven development was because everyone had a different definition. They had a definition as they thought it applied to their organization. There was one um, in the broader community. But if people don't have that similar terminology, then it's very difficult to have aligned conversations and conversations that then allow you to improve and increase the uh, speed of flow through your organization. Um, so team topologies is fantastic for that. It's a very approachable set of terminology that helps you understand teams, how they collaborate, um, and the, the issues around all of that to allow people from different areas of a business to all have a highly aligned conversation. And also books like The Goal or The Phoenix Project allow you then to have shared experiences. So even though not everyone has lived that process, people can have conversations about, well, in this book, they saw this challenge and they went through this process. If you can have that similar level of alignment, not only on the language, but also some of the experiences as people have um, transitioned to a new way of working, that's really powerful. Um, an alignment on what the core focuses of what are the core fo focuses of an organization. So we've got this concept of undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, so an example of that, at one point, it was a key differentiator of a bank, for example, to have a data center. And the banks that could run the best data centers would then could be the best banks. But in this really fast paced digital world, that's no longer true. Um, Wardley mapping, for example, is a really great pattern that we're seeing lots of organization use to do this, um, but also core domain charts can be used um, to achieve the same goal. So it allows you to focus on what is core for this business now, what is supporting us, um, and what is generic, what is no longer a differentiator for us. And that allows us to focus our teams on differentiated activity and away from the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and there's a layer on top of this as seen in this diagram where you can add in the team topologies, team types and the interaction. And that just adds a greater level of um, value and insight from doing this process. And so one of the biggest challenges of the flow of value and people working in that state of flow is that teams are often made up of teams of people who also belong to other teams. Um, so this can mean that people are attending multiple meetings for multiple teams every single day, trying to work across those multiple teams. Um, and there was also often a culture of the busier you are, the most important, the more valuable you are. If you are seen to be incredibly busy and doing all of this context switching and managing all of this um, cognitive load, then you are seen to be um, more valuable. So, but organizations that can enable people to exist in just that single team are saying a huge um, drop in the context switching that the people in that team do, the cognitive load, and therefore the productivity of those people actually increases, even though they're 
the busyness is going to go down. Um, the other element, or the, another key pattern that I'm seeing certainly with lots of clients that I work with is that organizations are reinventing what has already been identified and diagnosed. That organizations see, think that we are special, we have a special context, we're already very good, or we're, um, we're too busy to think um, and look outside of our organization for answers. But I think you can understand that this body of work and there are communities of people that exist around these really core concepts that can help you um, solve that productivity issues, uh, gain insight and move even faster. Um, so there's a question here around how does your organization learn from these communities or even identify that they exist in the, the first in the first place? Um, and how do your teams find the time to learn from these organizations? How are the, the managers and the leaders within the organization giving people time to look, to learn, um, to listen for new ideas? Um, and then I guess this is my final point, I think, in this section around how are organizations looking to boost the flow of value? They And to do that, Oftentimes, they need to look for a new way to shop for services and support. They need to learn about how to exploit enabling partners that will instill residual capabilities. So one of the end states, certainly for me, in team topologies is that organizations become a sensing organization. The point is not to create a one-off organization chart and that be the end and that be in place forever. It's finding a partner that can help build the ability to listen to sense for awkward interactions between teams and to continuously iterate on faster flow, how to continuously change the organization over time and as new challenges come along. So it's not a one-off activity and partners like Conflux and Armacuni have a track record of enabling that residual capability and leaving it within the team so that they are then on that trajectory of being a sensing organization and then iterating as they go. Um, so in terms of just a summary for this last section, we're really focusing on trying to make the visualization of flow and the terminology around that a norm, that we can build that shared language so everyone can have quick conversations based on similar mental models, um, that we've got a really core focus in terms of what is differentiating um, for our organization and for our teams, and what is the focus of their individual time, um, how we can invest um, in the community, so learning from the community, but also having the time to give back to that community, sharing ideas between organizations, and how can we find those flow enabling teams that are there to build that residual capability in the team, not to deliver individual chunks or individual outcomes, but build that um, learning that will then persist into the future. Thank you, Ben. So we've seen four things today in this webinar. We've looked a little bit about the actual productivity challenge and how many organizations really are using a pre-digital operating model um, that is really not suited to, to, to fast flow and therefore is, is uh, contributing to this lack of productivity. We had a look, look at uh, the use of platforms for non-blocking flow. So that's the, that that kind of particular concept comes from team topologies, really. Um, we certainly with the focus on on flow and reducing cognitive load. Um, a kind of new role for managers, really, uh, or an enhanced role, which is about finding flow, unblocking flow, rather than trying to coordinate all of these moving parts. And then we've had a look at some of these success patterns um, for adopting the kind of team topologies and and a fast flow approach. So many organizations have had these pre-digital operating models. Modern platforms should be obsessed with flow and wait times in teams consuming the platform. Managing flow is more effective and satisfying than managing for deadlines and dates. And we need to visualize flow and with kind of support from uh, partners with this, this flow aligned uh, savvy, retain new capabilities and, and unblock flow. And there's a quick summary again, like we saw at the beginning. Think about multi-team flow as a way to improve productivity. 
And so thank you very much for everyone attending. If you'd like to see more, go to almacuni.com or complexhq.com. And we'll take some questions now. Thank you, Matthew and Benedict. That was really insightful. I hope that everyone has, that has joined enjoyed it as much as I did. We have received lots of questions, so we'll be working our way through them. If you want to ask anything, the Q&A box is still open. We'll answer as many as we can, but anything that we don't get to, um, we'll follow up with an answer via email also. Um, so first question comes from Nick. I struggle with the concept of complex subsystem teams. In the book, it says to avoid them, but you still include them as a team type. And surely every team wants to think that they deal with complex stuff. So how should we think about them really? And when should we best use them? And when should we avoid them? So lots of questions all about complex subsystem teams. So thank you, Nick. Uh, first thing to say is not complex subsystem, it's complicated subsystem in the team, in team to bodies book. Complex, we deliberately chose the word complicated because it's, if you look at some of the wording from uh, Kinevin, which is the, the framework for thinking about complex adaptive systems, there's a big difference between complicated and complex. Complex is where you've got emergent behavior, and complicated is where it's just really involved, but still quite predictable. Um, so the complicated subsystem team is for situations where we've got um, a complicated problem where we need expertise applied at a really focused level. Um, and if you look at page 91, 92 in the team topologies book, it, it gives you some clues about where we should, where we should use a complicated subsystem team. The only place we should use it is if, so if we need to build something like, let's say a video processing algorithm or something like this, if we do actually need to build that, in our organization, if that's part of our differentiation, if it's part of our differentiation, then we might build it. Um, because we might just be able to consume it from the outside as a generic thing, just as, as, as Ben showed with the, with the core domain charts. However, if we decide we do actually need to build this ourselves for dif to differentiate our offering, then our starting point should be, well, can we actually have that, can, can a streamlined team take on the responsibility of building that stuff? Because if they can, if we've got a team of people who actually are really switched on and really understand video processing and all the matrix maths that goes with it and blah, 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 just leave it inside the streamline team for now, at least only at the point where we're hitting the team cognitive load limit of that streamline team, should we consider taking it out and, and putting it into a complicated subsystem team. We're always driving decisions in team topology through flow and team cognitive load and that what I've realized is that those two things really help to drive a lot of decisions like ar around the use of complicated subsystem teams. So that would be my starting point. Look at look at like kind of page 91, page 92, but really, really decide, can we get away without it for as long as possible? And if we can, then go for it. But at the point where we're really hitting these cognitive load limits, because we're asking teams effectively to do too much outside of their expertise, then we might pull together a complicated subsystem team, but we're doing it because it's going to improve flow in teams that are going to then use this subsystem because we've reduced their cognitive load. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, there's, God, there's quite a lot coming through, so I'll try to pass through them quickly. Um, we have one here from Mark. Any tips on helping to change mindsets of many senior leaders and investors who are driven by feature milestones and delivery rather than iterative value delivery. Who would like to take that? Ben. Um, I certainly think in the, the teams that we are working with, there is um, the ability to A, visualize the flow so they can start to see that um, the, the, that storytelling element of we were in this sort of mode in terms of how we were working and how we were delivering. Uh, and over time, through the introduction of ideas from this space, we have moved the needle on these on these things. So that storytelling over time, I think, is very important. Also, the ability to show in, in metric view how we are moving the needle on these things. And Matthew talked about the Dora metrics. He also turned about lead time. Um, and fundamentally, the higher you go in an organization, the, you're going to find people are starting to be very interested in how quickly we can get feedback on ideas. What is that lead time? And if we can embed the metrics um, and the ability to see dials starting to move, you get that very powerful um, 
storytelling, um, evangelizing um, set of artifacts that you can share and starts to have a, you know, people really respond to that, I think. I don't know if you add anything else to that, Matthew. Or whether we're just I so think, many questions. I mean, I, yeah, I think I think ultimately we need to persuade people to to try it, like to, to see what happens when you actually enable that kind of flow of value, and we start to see getting we start to see value to customers much more quickly, because um, if that starts to happen and customers like it or users like it, and and we, we're able to actually avoid doing a lot of work, then that has very strong connection through to better business outcomes anyway. So we need to get the opportunity to prove that way of working. There's a question here around, actually there's a lot of questions around blocking issues. Um, here's one from Ian. The application of standards and subjective views are particularly difficult blocking issues to remove. Are there any blocking issues that cannot be converted to non-blocking? That's a good question. Um, um, probably yes because you probably want to have some kinds of decisions still um, the, the decisions that decisions that, that, that happen much less frequently or are uh, unusual you're still going to want to run through human beings because you've not automated there's no point in automating them but certainly the things that decisions that need to be done on a repeated regular basis you need to find ways to automate the decisions around them um, whether it's uh, is this content ready to go out? Is this legal document ready to sign? All of this kind of stuff it, within certain parameters. So let's say if the legal agreement is for an amount that is less than $200,000, we can automate the, the, the decision criteria around that and so on and so on. So set some criteria around it, but over time you're expecting to automate more and more of the re repeated, repeatable decisions. Um, now, some, sometimes the technology is not available. You have to decide, is it worth building all of that automation around it? You, what you might do instead is wait for the some maturity in the technology landscape to come along to help you use a tool which helps you do that thing so for example at the moment so if you go back 15 years there was not much automation around cloud infrastructure now there is uh, and, and a kind of decision criteria around is it ready to deploy now we've got um automation around uh, compliance coming out tools that are being that are made available now in in the in the IT space to help with automated compliance decisions so sometimes you have to wait for the right time to 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 automate a bunch of this stuff but you always need to be scanning the market and seeing what's coming up what's going to be available seem to help you automate more of these kind of decisions but some sometimes the automation is not is not fully automated by code sometimes it's just if we have a set of parameters around this service we're offering we can turn around a decision in a guaranteed amount of time, even if it's just all humans still doing that stuff. We, we put a service wrapper around it and still decide to, to, to offer a kind of um, something as a service, even if there's not much code involved. I think there's also a mark, there's a, thinking more of like the transition and the transformation of, of these value streams, also just challenging yourself to have a mindset of, could, could this be automated? Could I make this non-blocking? Even just the, um, just the thought experiment of I've got this blocking change. Could I make this non-blocking? What would that look like? And just coming from that end of the spectrum, as opposed to thinking, um, is there going to be things that just will always be blocking? Um, because there's some resistance in some parts of that transformational process. There is some inherent resistance in, in people or systems um, that mean actually having a mindset and coming from the other end is useful. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've still got lots and lots of questions though. Um, so we won't be able to get through most of these now, but what we will do for all, any questions that we haven't answered um, is to be able to put a response together and be able to um, send it out on email, Ben, or put it on our website. Either way, um, it will be accessible for you to be able to get your answers. Um, 
thank you very much, both of you, for uh, taking the time. Uh, for everyone that's joined us today, uh, we'll be sending not only the answers to the questions, but a full recording of the video today. It's been a pleasure having both Ben and Matthew with us today. Um, actually, I should say before we go, both Ben and Matthew will be speaking at the Fast Flow Conference, which will be held on the 25th of May. Um, we'll include a link in the email um, if you want to hear more about team topologies. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Matthew.